He's a uh, an English that guy. Well, UK, whatever. I don't know what mm-hmm. it is. Yeah, you better you better not get that wrong. Oh, he's Jamaican. <laughs> no, he's not. You're lying. His paternal grandfather was Jamaican, and one of his grandmothers was Swedish, and that just turns into to the, yeah. So whatever. Um, the Jamaican absorbs the Swedish. <laughs> yeah, let's just start from the top. So. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of I Finally Watched. This is David. And this is Alon, and I finally watched Snatch. When I watched this one, as soon as I started it, it kind of was all coming back to me, and I all, you know, I remembered all of it, and I think I've only watched this once before, maybe twice, or maybe seen parts of it on TV. Um, But when we did Lockstock, I didn't remember any of that and i know i'd watched it and i said i didn't you know didn't watch it the first time under the best of circumstances but this one was like so much more familiar to me like how it was going to happen everything that goes down and what's also too like interesting about guy Ritchie movies is they just they have such a great flow there's there's like no fat and like things are moving so quickly in these yeah like there's a whole point where in between where Mickey's mom is killed and then there's like a 20 minutes before we see Mickey again. Like after that, there's this whole story with like um, Boris and Vinnie Jones like going after him and then Saul and the other two black guys like going out. This whole like side plot that connects to it that is just like so entertaining. But even with that, it's like so quick. Yeah. I told you that I like this one a lot more. And watching it, I do, not to say anything bad about Lockstock, but I just do prefer this one. Um, so, Alon, what did you think? Well, to your point where there's like this, this way of storytelling, um, I guess in, in early Guy Ritchie films in general, but especially this one, I told you I watched it last night. Um, but I kind of dozed off a couple times in the middle, which I, I rewatched it in full today and I really didn't miss anything. The only part that I actually like fell asleep in because watching it again, I did not remember this part was the final boxing fight with Brad Pitt. <laughs> it's a pretty um, key. It's a pretty key moment. No, but I mean, I'm like, if once you get the result of that, you understand it. But like now watching it again, it's like you you can really tell that the budget is a lot bigger for for Snatch. And it like it takes the idea of Lockstock and really fine tunes it and polishes it for Snatch. There's something about the story of Lockstock that I like better, actually, than Snatch. But the execution, you just can't deny, is is better than Snatch. The the other thing about this, though, is he goes for a lot more just, like, strictly comedic moments in this. Like, one example to me is Benicio Del Toro, which, by the way, just having Benicio Del Toro in such a small part, like, your movie is automatically better. But the part where he's talking to uh, Farina on the phone, Avi... And every time the camera goes back to Benicio Del Toro, he's wearing a different suit or a different color suit or a different hat or like it keeps <laughs> changing. And it's like it's like a fucking like, you know, just like purposely like over the top going for comedy rather than kind of more subtle in Lockstock, you know? Well, sure. And and another thing that goes over the top is the editing in, in this. And I think I mentioned like when when do we get such a because I think Guy Ritchie is really known for his editing style in his movies, and you don't really see that in Lockstock all that much. But it really hits you over the head uh, in this movie, with especially like the beginning with the Jewish robbery scene. Um, just like the camera zooms, the camera flips, the transitions from one guy's arm with a gun to another guy's arm with a gun. Um Stuff like that, like the freeze frames and stuff, just gives it a real style. That I, I guess you could say that hasn't aged in a great way, but because it's very, show, it's very showy. Yeah, yeah, and I, I mean, like, 
if you like these types of movies and you know what you're going in for, it doesn't bother you, right? But if you if you were to do this exact type of editing style nowadays, people would be like, what the fuck, you know? So I like this like in small doses, right? So like going into a Guy Ritchie movie, I know what I'm going in for and so I like it. But if like all movies looked like this, I'd be like, all right, let's 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 bring it back. But you know, like um it reminds me of like early early two thousands. Like I think Fast and Furious is a good example of having like that very early two thousands look to it. But every mo- movie from like two thousand to two thousand five, two thousand six had that kind of look. So like if you if you if you watch a bunch of early 2000 movies nowadays, back to back to back, you could get sick of that style real fast. No, yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's uh, the other thing I didn't realize until I read it, but it's kind of obvious. So that opening bank or uh, heist with the the guys dressed as rabbis, um, they're doing a whole talk about how uh, the Virgin Mary, and that yeah. is sort of a callback to reservoir dogs the like a virgin talk at the beginning of reservoir dogs it's like an homage <laughs> to that um the way that was shot though i have to say like going like panning from the security camera footage to the security camera footage i i don't know like both times watching this i was just like really impressed by that yeah yeah the the one thing that uh i agree doesn't age the best is the then right after that having the like a little like montage of every character <laughs> like their <laughs> name and stuff which was so unhel- like i still didn't remember anyone's name like i had to like hear it again it's like wasn't helping me watching it a second time and knowing everyone from then on really actually helps you keep track of it but like going into it blind and then seeing that you don't remember a fucking thing after that, like 15, you know, 30 seconds of, of intro. I will say there's an editing thing where I really like uh, where it has to do, I think both times with the revolver and they, they spin the revolver before clicking it in Uh and you are like almost like the POV of the spin, like a carousel. uh, And then the click, transitions you to a different click so when uh tommy is buys the huge ass revolver from uh um boris the blade he's explaining it to turkish right he's like i got this from boris the blade he clicks it in and it clicks in when like a few days earlier when he was buying it from him right so those like transitions i thought were cool like i still think those hold up right no no yeah i i agree I um the the also he he kind of does some some like things with like the linear timing of the story to sort of trick you which like you know you've been watching movies long enough so obviously you could catch it but like the whole part where you see like the car crashes like in the middle with Saul and Vinny Jones and and um Tommy yeah. and uh, you, you know one other thing that I I thought was kind of interesting in this so Jason Fleming who is like one of the main four guys he's the the fat man in Lockstock okay um just has a basically a non-speaking part in this movie as sort of Brad Pitt's sidekick amongst the um so let's just say this now so um from the time this movie was made until now the term gypsies and pikey are like highly offensive specifically like in that region. I don't think Pikey um, was ever taken nicely. Is is it's always been a, like a slur, but now it's like you, you know just, you know, don't call people that. So like, I don't know. We're going to have to tiptoe around what to call them, nomads, I guess. But he's part of like Brad Pitt's crew of like the nomad people and um he like barely says anything and I think it's I I couldn't find anything on the backstory. I didn't do much research, but I couldn't find anything on the backstory of like, why wasn't he just Turkish's sidekick? You know, Stephen Graham wasn't in the first one and he's obviously great in this. So I'm not saying like I want him replaced, but it's like you have a dude who is in your first movie. Like, why would you give him this small role instead of like the main, like one of the main roles with, you know, the Tommy character? Maybe it's just you didn't think he fit, but I I feel like he could have done it. Um, It's just an interesting kind of choice of like, a guy that was in your first movie and like giving him the smaller part in your second one is interesting. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, Darren did have some lines, like when they were selling um, the caravan to Turkish. And well, I guess Turkish wasn't there, but Gorgeous and Tommy was buying the caravan. Uh, you know, Jason Fleming had some had some lines there. And when they burn his mom's uh, caravan down, um, Turkish and Tommy went to go visit Mickey and and, and Darren had some lines there. But I don't know. I mean, I big budget, hire Brad Pitt. If that's what you do. Well, so apparently Brad Pitt saw Lockstock and called Guy Ritchie and was like, hey, I want to be in your next movie. And Guy Ritchie said yes. And then realized he didn't really have a role for Brad Pitt. So like added the role of Mickey, which obviously completely changes the fucking movie to have like Mickey's an integral player in this whole thing. Well, did he add the role of Mickey from nothing or did he add the role of Mickey to better suit Brad Pitt? I could see that falling into play. Well, I just said add. I mean, once again, I don't know. I didn't talk to guy myself. I'll, um, I'll get ask him on him here next time. Yeah. Just at the next meeting. Um, and then I did read that Stephen Graham, who does play Tommy basically just went with a friend to the audition. And then after his friend auditioned guy, Richie's like, are you next? And he's like, oh, uh, I need to read the script. And he's like, well, why don't you just fucking ad lib, see what you can do. And that got him the part. Man, I love those kind of stories because they're like one in a million, you know. Well, and it like sets up, I mean, I think it probably sets up the rest of his career. I didn't look, but I mean, the fact that like he had to like just audition for this and now he's like a very known guy. He's a, an English that guy. Well, UK, whatever. I don't know what mm-hmm. it is. Yeah, you better, you better not get that wrong. Oh, he's Jamaican. <laughs> No, he's not. You're lying. <laughs> his paternal grandfather was Jamaican and one of his grandmothers was Swedish. And that just turns into to the, yeah, so whatever. Um, the Jamaican absorbs the Swedish. <laughs> yeah, let's just start from the top. So we have this diamond heist and then Benicio Del Toro is going to take this to Dennis Frina, who plays Avi. Um, but he has to go to London first. And apparently Benicio has like a huge gambling problem. Uh, and one thing that's interesting from the beginning of this, the guy who's like asking him about the ring and telling him, Oh, I know a guy who can get you a gun. Like you can obviously tell that he's like interested in that, in that diamond a little too much, not the ring, but the diamond. Um, yeah. but then he asks him, he's like, when is his, when's your flight? And he says, Oh, it's in 20 minutes. It's like, that's such pre nine 11. Like, oh, I'm not even at the airport and my flight's in 20 minutes. I'm just going to roll up and walk to, onto my plane. You know, um, recently I got, I got, because I travel a lot for work. I, uh, I was waiting for my colleague to show up at the airport with me. And I'm always such a worry war when it, it comes to the airport. So I always get to the airport like two hours early. And my my colleague got to the airport 20 minutes before we board. And he just got through security down the terminal to the gate right on time. I mean, it's possible. It's definitely possible at my airport. I mean, it's possible only if you have absolutely no one in the security line. You know, that's it. Or if you have like the pre-check. Um, yeah. So... Then we have kind of the setup of this sort of boxing thing where Turkish and Tommy work together promoting boxers and they're dealing with Bricktop, which I told you Bricktop is the main bad guy in this. And he was, you know, okay, so that's the guy you're talking about. I got. Yeah, yeah. Um, He is Sting's partner in Lockstock. He narrated Lockstock. Yeah, there was only like very small narration in that movie, but he narrated it. What I found funny is that all the narration for this movie was Statham. Statham, yeah. Yeah, she does a good job of it's very much it's very interesting that like in the first movie, Statham is definitely not put front and center in that movie. Like he's it's right. kind of an ensemble piece and he's just a part of that those four guys. In this, he is very much like the front and center of this movie for the parts he's in. Oh, no, definitely. He's definitely the main character. I also um, I also love the running joke where Bricktop like just doesn't respect Tommy at all and like tell him to shut the fuck up like if he talks again I'm gonna you know sick my dogs on him it's like he keeps doing it it's so funny. There's also a running joke kind of alongside that where it's like 
It goes, Bricktop lo- loves Tommy. And obviously it's sar- like sarcasm, like he hates Tommy. But there's like a few times in the movie they're like, oh, I, you know, blah, 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 so-and-so loves this guy. And it's just pure hatred towards that character. Right. Um, This is like, there's so much fucking setup for this movie. So they are going to buy a caravan from Mickey. And then because of that, Mickey, like, fights gorgeous george who is their boxer and just knocks him out in one punch which is such like a cool scene i love the turkish narration afterwards where he's like uh tommy really hopes that gorgeous george wakes up because if he doesn't then they're just gonna kill him and bury (laughs) both of them because they don't have to want to have to deal with the dead body uh or you know deal with a witness to them killing somebody and just kind of showing tommy like cowering in the corner like fuck please wake up um but one interesting thing that this movie does is it kind of sets up that Brad Pitt and his people like always win, right? Like they have these bets. They always win. Like everything kind of like works out for them except for the death of his mother. But like he has a bet with Tommy. He wins it. He has a bet with Turkish. He wins it. He gets told to take a dive. And if he doesn't, he's going to die. And in the end, he sets everything up. So he wins the bet. And Turkish even says with the narration, he's like, I should have known he wasn't going to take a dive because he always bets on himself. Like, So he bet on himself, had everything set up to kill all these guys that were going to kill his people and then gets yep. away scot-free. Yeah. Um, so it's just like, that's actually kind of one of the points when you know that, you know, for most of this movie, Bricktop is very even keeled for like a gangster overlord, right? Like, so he right. keeps, you know, uh, Brad Pitt doesn't take a dive in the first fight. And you think, oh, he's just going to kill Turkish and Tommy. He's like, no, I'm going to give you another shot. We're going to set up another fight and you're going to take the dive this time. The the black guys, you know, try and rob his his bookie shop. And he's like, oh, I'm going to kill you. And they're like, but we can get you a diamond. He's like, okay, I'll give you a chance. Give me that diamond. Like he keeps giving people chances. And then Turkish comes to him and he's like, hey, if you buy his mom this caravan, then he'll take the dive. And in a moment of like the one time he doesn't kind of do the, the sort of more well right thought out thing. thing. He just does the yeah. evil thing. He like is going to kill Turkish, which is crazy. Like he, well, I guess they're just going to break Turkish's store. And because Turkish starts hitting all of them, they're going to basically like beat the shit out of Turkish until Tommy saves him. But then they fucking kill Mickey's mom. And that like that one move ends Bricktop's life. Good. And then maybe he was fed to the pigs. I did not realize that pigs could just go through that many people that fast. I mean, this isn't a documentary. I don't know if it's true, but I think it's true. I've heard that before in like a Criminal Minds episode. And that's you were in. that's fact. <laughs> um, no, so so yeah, and okay, so we have all this setup right where, um, uh, as all this is going on. There's the what what was 84 carat diamond. It's kind of being tossed around. That's what was robbed in the opening scene with Benicio del Toro. And I guess you're just kind of trying to find like where this diamond and where, you know, all this is being connected to because you have like, you have the Boris, the blade storyline, and then you have the, um, what is it called? The the head. Doug Doug the head storyline. Yeah, well he's the the I mean they the, that connects sorta of to the Boris one, right? But du- yeah, Doug works for Avi and he's supposed well, works with and he's supposed to look at the diamond that Benicio del Toro is bringing. But Benicio Benicio also goes to Boris for a gun and it then gets robbed. He gets robbed by the guys Boris hire. The three black guys. Yeah, Saul, Tyrone, and Vinny. What's funny, though, is they're waiting in front of that bookie for the entire time to rob Benicio, but they have backed their car into his van, preventing him from getting out of his van to go yeah. so he can get robbed. Um, there are a couple lines before. Yeah, I think we can kind of probably move forward to the point where um, Benicio gets kind of kidnapped by Tyrone. But... Um, there's a couple lines. One Bricktop is talking to one of his guys and the guy's like, yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you so much. And the guy's like, he goes, 
<laughs> pull your tongue out of my asshole, Gary. <laughs> and then the other one, um, which is like in the com- in the trailer and like is a very famous one. He's like, you like dags? He's like, do I like dags? Like, yeah, you like dags? Oh, yeah, I like dags. Like looking at the dog over there is a pretty like funny back and forth. Maybe you can clarify for me the first two uh, people that um, uh, Bricktop Kill. Uh, I guess one ratted the other one out as being like not loyal, right? But then he takes out his snitch anyways for what? Just being a snitch? I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't think, I think it just, I think the whole point of that is just to show you what he's, he's capable of that killing. He's evil. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like that he's, he is not to be fucked with. Um, and so we have the first boxing match with Brad Pitt. And because this dude headbutts him, he just knocks the guy out with one punch, which I think also like the boxing in this definitely has an effect on like the fighting from Sherlock Holmes. You know what I mean? Like the way that oh, I almost yeah, yeah, yeah. I almost forget Guy Ritchie does that, like did the Sherlock Holmes movies, yeah, me too. but like um, the way that uh, Robert Downey Jr. kind of fights in those is definitely like very reminiscent of this. Um, probably some of the same people in like the boxing and this and that. Um but yeah, and then while while that's going on, Saul goes to rob the bookies and she's like, well, all the bets are off. He's like, I don't care. Give me the money. He's like, well, because the bets are off, we don't have any money. And then, of course, like the the expression, all bets are off. Right. Yeah. So it's like that's the play there. And, you know, talking about this, it occurs to me how separate the two storylines really are. And they just intercut continuously with each other. And of course, they come full head at the end right to together at the end but really you have this whole storyline with the diamond kind of traveling through from benicio to boris well from from the guys that boris hired to boris the funny another funny scene is when brings out the diamond they're like we want this now he's like just take the 10 grand he's like no we want this from the time they walk into the room to the time Boris pulls his gun and kills Benicio, for some reason they put the diamond back in the case and he just kills the Benicio, the only guy who knows <laughs> the thing, the the you know, to open the case. So he has to like chop off Benicio's arm and then take it with him. <laughs> yeah, which makes no sense like why they put it right back in. But I like to Boris is like they're talking to him and they're like, no, we won't half and da to Boris. And then he shoots him and they're like, what the fuck? And he's like, you said my name. Like you couldn't say my name in front of him, which is funny too. Cause it's like Benicio, you know, is a big name to you and I now. And so to have him in this role where he's like, gets killed very quickly on almost just as like a plot point, um, is like pretty interesting. Uh, and also, so as they're robbing the bookie, Saul, Vinny, and, and Tyrone, I like that like they just get so frustrated and flustered that they like take their masks off and look up and like, what the fuck? And then later on, Bricktop is watching this and like, oh, we don't know these guys at all. And then Tyrone walks in and they're like, oh, that fat fuck. All right, let's go get him. <laughs> it's Tyrone. Tyrone blew it. Um, what happened to the diamond after Boris took it? Just Boris has it all this time then? Boris had it until Vinny came and took it from him. So Abby comes from New York. Yeah. Um, goes to the the head, and then the head's twin daughters say, Oh, you should hire this guy. Frankie find Four out- Finger. Oh no, he's not Frankie Four Finger. He's, he's like the bullet tooth. tooth. Yeah. Yeah. Should I call you bullet or tooth? He's like, you can call me Susan if you want. Um Tony. <laughs> We we're, we're, we're gonna get caught up on this. Hold on, let's look. It's now. Tony. I don't, you don't even have to look it up. Bullet tooth Tony, motherfucker. There we are. You know, I'm proud of you. Um, well, it helps because there was a little montage in the beginning. <laughs> oh yeah, there we go. I uh, I love the little part. So, you know, they Bricktop comes to Turkish and Tommy. Or, and basically says you got to ha- do another fight, and then he also takes all of Turkish's money. And then at the same time, they then go after Tyrone because they recognize him from the camera footage. And 
the use of so Turkish makes oh, a bet juxta- with Mickey juxtapose yeah, with the rabbit, right? Yeah. And so the dogs are chasing the rabbit as Tyrone is getting chased, and then Ty- Tyrone gets caught. He gets brought into this room. He's not talking. And then the dogs grab on his ankles and you see the dogs about to get the rabbit. And then Tyrone says, okay, I'll give you what you want. And then you see the rabbit get away. And then the way Mickey just comes up to him and shows him the caravan again, he's like periwinkle blue <laughs> and like walks away. Yeah. Um, and once again, Mickey doesn't lose bets, you know? No. I mean, did they drug the dog? I like how Tommy continuously too brings up that like, Hey, we were trying to buy a caravan from him and now he wants a caravan. Well, this doesn't make any sense. Yeah, but that's what I mean. Like the the way like things are moved in this movie is kind of funny, right? Like the whole reason they did not go to Mickey and the Gypsies for any any other reason than trying to buy a new caravan just to work their you know underground boxing uh, promoting business out of right. But then it just unfolds into this whole thing where now they have to hire Mickey to replace the boxer that he knocked out and because they're you know and i love uh turkish's jason statham's explanation in his voiceover when he's like you don't want to owe brick top because then you'll be in his debt and if you're in his debt then you're in his pocket if you're in his pocket you're never going to climb out and then like a few scenes later all this happens they have to change the fighter and he's like and this is what I didn't want. We're now in his pocket, you know? Right. No, yeah. Yeah, because, well, when they had to change fighters, yeah, he he's basically like, oh, now we're kind of screwed. We have to, because I think maybe what originally they were just going to have a normal fight. And then now because he switches fighters, he's like, you need to take a dive so we can do that. What's so weird is it feels like Bricktop is just telling everyone, <laughs> like, very loudly, <laughs> like, he's going to take a dive in the fourth. And it's like, Who's betting the other side of this? There's only like 20 myself. people in this room. I think it's those two guys that they kept uh, zooming in on that that were like the the um, the big bitters or whatever you call it. You know, well, they seem to be probably like other big kind of like gangster type guys, right? So that's probably why he was a little worried about them. I guess, yeah. It's funny too because Bricktop is like the overarching villain. But then he has guys he's kind of worried about. It's funny to think about. No, yeah, absolutely. Um, So Turkish goes to Bricktop and says, we need a caravan. That that's how he'll fight. And in response to this, Bricktop starts basically bashing all of the slot machines at Turkish's and Tommy's. And, you know, Tommy has to save him with that gun that he kept making fun of that, like, won't work. And then he kills Bricktop kills Mickey's mom, Brad Pitt's mom, which is like a very sad scene. Um, and then after that, we kind of get this whole like, as I said, it's like 20 minute side story of Vinny getting hired, them figuring out they go to they go to like Tyrone and they go to Saul and Vinny. Yeah, I'm going to I guess I got to use Vinnie Jones. I got to use Bullet Tooth Tony because there's a Vinnie character in this. I was just calling him Vinnie Jones. But they go to Saul and Saul immediately tells him about Boris. And uh, Vinnie Jones is like, fuck, Boris is XKGB. He's impossible to track down. And then they like the daughters call and he's like, yeah, there's this Russian guy here who's trying to sell an 84 carat <laughs> diamond. Um, it's just like a really funny like, oh, we're not going to make this too difficult. But the next part, I think from similar to Lockstock, from here on out, we've had so we've had so much setup. From here on out is like the best part of this movie. Like the 20 to 30 minutes of of the like Boris, all of that storyline, and Avi, and then Avi finally like leaving, and they're like, Do you have anything to declare? He's like, Yeah, fuck London. Like that part, and then the last boxing mar- match to the end, like that's like my favorite part of this movie. For me, for me, it was um, where they're driving and Tommy is explain is explaining to Turkish how the human body isn't actually like developed and evolved enough to digest milk. And so he's like, I'm going to do you a favor. And he takes the milk carton and he throws it out the window and you hear a car crash because of that. 
that's when I think the whole thing is similar to Lockstock. Everything starts coming together and unfolding because he throws the milk out. It lands on a uh, Avi and and um, uh, Tony's car. Yep, and it kills Ro- Rosebud because Rosebud has like a sword in his hand. So that crash stabs him. Boris gets out of the trunk, but then immediately <laughs> gets hit um, by uh, Vinny, Vinny's crew. Mm-hmm. And so this is where all all like the the. <sighs> it's funny too because. At that same time, even though they're not part of the crash, Turkish and uh, Tommy are going to Boris's place uh, to go get the gun or no, to, sorry, to go get the diamond. And then um, the as they're going to his place, Tommy's like, I'm going to fucking give him a piece of my mind. I gave me a gun. That didn't work. I'm going to get a gun that does work. At the same time, Boris comes like from being like kidnapped, bagged over the head and hit by a car. He comes in, slams Tommy in the nuts, grabs like this huge fucking gun and goes to try to uh, kill everyone. Get them get uh, get his diamond back from Avi and, and Tony at this. <laughs> but, <laughs> but Tony and Avi are like in a pub uh, and it's one of the best line readings, I think in the whole movie is when Tom, uh, Tony is being held up by, um, Saul and Vinny and, um, and the other guy, Tyrone. Yeah. And, um, it's like, he goes, he goes, yeah. And you guys, and he's comparing them to a penis. Right. And he's like, now shrivel up and take your balls with you because you guys have replica, written on the side of your guns and I have desert Eagle 0. 0.50 written on the side of mine. And then it does like the, you know, the guy Richie zoom in. I was like, Oh man, just giving Vinny Jones the best line in the whole movie. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I like, I kind of said this a little bit earlier too, but I love the way that they first have Saul and his crew driving and he's like, Oh, we have these fake guns and then they shoot the fake gun but blows it's, out the windows. Yeah. And then they kind of run into a dude and you know that they just ran in to Boris. And you're like, well, how did Boris get out of the trunk? And then the next thing you see is the milk is, being is the thrown. milk throw and yeah. a car crash. And you're like, well, what the fuck was that? And then the next thing you see is the milk hitting Vinnie Jones and Abby's car and yeah. crashing. And then great. all these people surrounding it. And then you see Boris get out of the car. You're just watching. And the movie does this really smart thing of, you know, he's about to get hit, but it plays it up for like 15 seconds of him walking around in the middle of the road before he gets hit. Cause you know, it has to happen. Did Uh, it ever explain why it was like the, the witnesses were only middle Eastern women. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. I don't know. Just the part of town, I guess. I thought they were like Indian, but I wasn't paying too close attention. Cause I was like, I kind of know what happens in this area. Um, so then, right after this, they go, they try and hold up Vinnie Jones. He says, fuck off. They then go, are about to leave, but they see Avi with the case. Right. They try and take the diamond from him. Boris shows up, right. and I just, I love, he tells him to tie his shoes, so Avi gets down, he shoots through, and then he shoots Boris, like, I guess five more times, or six more, whatever, Basically has to empty his clip and he's like, wow, this is really fucking hard. Shoots him again and then points again at Tyrone. He's like, oh, you're fucked. And it clicks. He's like, lucky fucking day. And then like walks out like so Tyrone should be dead. Uh, Does Tyrone die? No, no, no. Tyrone. That's the last time we see Tyrone. Tyrone's alive. Tyrone's like, I got got to get the fuck out of here. (laughs) So, yeah. And so Vinny and Saul take the briefcase with the diamond and they book it to their place. And then um, Abby's alive. Tony's alive, uh, but Boris is finally fucking dead. Well, and so they're going to Bricktop. They're outside of Bricktops, and he's pulling the diamond basically out of his taint. And the guy's like, why'd you put it there? He's like, well, what if we get mugged? And he's like, well, we're black guys with guns. Like, who's going to mug us? He's like, I don't know. Bricktooth Tony and... uh, His Desert Eagle. Yeah, and he's like, why would you say that? And then 
he shows up, obviously, and you like know it's going to happen. What's funny is you don't see Vinnie Jones in that scene. You just see a guy who kind of looks like Vinnie Jones walk up. Vinnie Vinnie? Jones, he didn't show up to work that day because he got arrested, apparently. (laughs) The oh night my before god. For, for fighting. Oh my god. Uh so they take him back. They take these guys back to their shop because they tell him they don't have the diamond. They're about to cut open the dog, and this guy what's crazy is Vinny doesn't want to let this dog get cut open, so he tells them he tells Vinny Jones and Abby, Oh, I have the diamond, it's right here. You're gonna die if you don't give that diamond to Bricktop. And the only reason they don't die is because Bricktop gets killed in by different people. But like you can't do that. You have to keep that diamond over the dog. Uh, and I also like they get walked into that room. They're standing closer to the door and Avi and uh, Tony are in the room. Just like run out the door. They don't have their weapons out. Just like book it the setup is so funny too because they're just like look let's just tell them it's back at the office and we'll come up with a story from there and they go down they go there and the setup is that they left the dog alone for like hours right so the dog like shit and pissed in a corner tore up everything so the first thing they want to do is open a window and and i think you see where it's going from there right (laughs) yeah they open a window and they're like, the dog ate it. Okay, we have to cut open the dog. Okay, no, I lied. The dog didn't eat it. I have it right here. Then the dog fucking eats it and jumps out the window. And I love how uh, when the dog eats it, Avi starts shooting at him, at the dog, trying to kill the dog before it, it escapes to no avail. And then you know you don't see tony die but you know that he has been shot by avi and at that moment avi is just like i'm leaving i don't care about the quarter of a million dollar diamond or however much it is actually 84 carats it's like maybe i am close maybe it is like a quarter of a it's 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 astronomical it's It's astronomical how much that would be worth especially now you know what's a great about that? So one, the first time we see Tony in the beginning, he is slamming someone's car head in a car door, yeah. just like Lockstock. And because of Lockstock, you think there's no way this guy will die, right? Like you don't even think it's possible. Right, and then right. he dies in such a fucking crazy way. And because of like you know, the kind of like the character that he plays, we don't even get to see the death, right? Because it's like, you know, I just think it's so kind of perfectly done in that way. And then that ends, Avi leaves. And so now we're back to kind of the main story where Mickey has been drinking because his mom died attending the wake. And then they kind of have to get him ready for the boxing match. Um, And Bricktop comes in. He's like, he better fucking go down in the fourth. Bricktop has everything set up to kill everybody if he doesn't do this right and i'm actually curious he he might have killed them either way yeah that's true i mean he had nothing to lose from killing them even if he won you probably need to kill them right because you killed the mom like you probably should kill all these people or leave town like well, bricktop's this... not leaving shit right i guess you're right So, I'm just trying to, hold on. So, the dog's gone. Oh, I I, I don't think it's mentioned enough that the dog was found at the, like, the gypsy camp. So, whenever it is... Oh, we agreed we're calling them nomads. Wow. I'm just calling them what the movie called them. Um, And I can't get in trouble for that, right? Um, Yeah, that's fine. (laughs) So... Yeah, so the the dog always goes there, and why? Because Vinny kidnapped the dog from there, I guess, is implied? I think because um, it's just, like, trained to. Because it's it, it's kind of this running joke that they, like, if you buy something from them, it's kind of defective, right? So if you get a dog from them, the dog is just going to run back to them. So they, like, got your money, and then they're just like you know, f- fuck you. 
Um, so I think <laughs> right. that's so, kind of. So anyways, the dog always runs, runs back to that. Right. And so um, that's, that's like the setup for there. And then. Well, and Saul and Saul and Vinny even say, um, you know, oh, he always runs back to the campsite. We'll take these guys. We'll get rid of the bodies and then we'll go to the campsite in the morning. Um, which, yeah, sets up the ending. So we have the boxing match. He, exactly. Yeah. Mickey punches the guy pretty hard and you think, oh, did he did he fucking do this again? Um, but he punches him enough for the guy to get up and then he's like going through the fight and he's like, they're like, you're not making this even look legit. We're still going to die if you don't make this look legit. And then he gets an uppercut that's shot really like there's a lot of effort put into that shot where he's kind of floating I, back. I was and wondering like a, if you read any fun facts about how they got that shot. I did not. That did it's not, such a cool shot. It is, but then he then he goes to an afterlife afterwards. <laughs> oh, I thought I took it like he's like got looking like up an after body, like an out of body experience sort of thing. Well, yeah, yeah, I know, but I mean that's kind of what I'm saying. Um, and then we have this, we have this, this movie does so many like, not Mr. X, but just like, oh, well, all we need to happen is this. And then the opposite happens. No mm-hmm. one's going to rob two black guys with guns in a car. Guy comes up to rob them. Mm-hmm. And so Turkish says, all we need is for Mickey to stay down right now. And Mickey gets up and knocks the dude out with one punch. Right. Um, and then the the movie, once again, plays with kind of the the linear story, like linear nature of the story where we see Bricktop outside and he's like talking to someone and he hears gunshots. And then he tells like, Oh, Hey, sh- give me the gun. I'm going to shoot these guys. And I love the the line from Turkish when he's like, you know, that moment before you think you're going to get killed, you kind of like recoil. And he's like, and looking back at it, you know, Mickey didn't, didn't flinch. And then we see what really happened. Like all the, the, um, the nomadic people, uh, kill all of Bricktop's guys, and then Bricktop yep. hears that, and Bricktop actually knows, oh, that's fucking happening. They're killing all my guys. And then he asks for the gun to kill these guys, and it's just a dude waiting with like shotguns, and they blast both of them away. And then Mickey has bet on himself, and then the next day is just, the camp is gone. I love the ending where like all these police pull up, and they're like, what the fuck are you doing here? And, and then the dog just happens to run up, and they're like, oh, just taking the the dog for a walk um and like then turkish is like and, hey and who who we'll was grab that? the like, dog like that wasn't local police was that like interpol or something um i don't Maybe. fucking know Maybe i mean i don't was, know I, like I just know. there's some guys um and it sort of ends i do love like so they're driving out. They have kind of gotten away with this. And they look over and Saul is there. And the cop is like, why do you have a body with a missing arm in your back? And the the kind of look that Saul gives him is like a shrug of the shoulders. Like, eh, sometimes you got dead bodies in your trunk. Um, why does he have a tea cozy on his head? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and then the movie ends with them, like, finding the diamond out of the dog. And then, you know, asking... The, the head like hey do you know someone who wants this and abby getting back on a plane um and i never thought about this before but like do they do they sell that diamond to abby or does abby like bring guys to take it from them you know they, no, no, was- no 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 i i took it that <laughs> abby's kind of kind of out of that whole like trying to get one under um maybe but i, I take it that the ending was meant to show that he came back to England to buy it. I love the passport yeah, well, stamp. The end. It's great. When you, um, I didn't notice this and I didn't go back to see it, but somewhere I read that when you, when he's introduced and his name is shown in the first part of the movie, um, he's looking at the diamond and it looks like he's looking at the diamond, like in his New York office. Yeah. So it's he like, is. he does end up with the diamond. Oh, yeah. I mean, but but they all I mean, they all are either have the diamond or it's imply the diamond gets passed around that everyone in that opening sequence. I didn't really think it meant anything. Yeah, but in order for him, Mickey had the diamond in the opening sequence. 
But in order for him to have the diamond in New York City, he had to end up with it. Unless we think that he like had it in the beginning, sold it to the guys in Antwerp and was stealing it back, maybe. I don't think it matters. Like, I think that whole I don't I think you have to just take that whole opening scene out of context. Like, it's just it's just an opener. Yeah, I mean, whatever. I'm just it's like it's just the thing that was in the movie. You're looking you too much into it. Up- You're looking. <laughs> You're trying to get me going. I don't really understand what's happening. I am. I am. Okay, we'll we'll stop it. Um, so you know we're kind of done here. One interesting thing I saw is that they originally offered the role of Bricktop to Sean Connery, and mm. he liked the script, but he had never seen Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels, so. Um, Matthew Vaughn, who was the producer, got a screening together. He watched it and he goes, that's a good film. Um, but then he whispers to him, but you're not going to be able to afford me. <laughs> so Sean Connery and did yet, not take part. And, they, and yet they could afford Brad Pitt and Benicio Del Toro. Well, I mean, Brad Pitt, this is 90s uh, or 2000, right? So it's like he wasn't, I mean, he was big, but like, I don't know. Brad, well, so Brad Pitt, once again, Brad Pitt wanted to be in this movie. So, you know, he probably took a little bit of a little a little bit of a that's cut. that's true. And you told me Brad Pitt was never in a sports movie. No, I said that he's boxed twice. And I think I specifically mentioned this one, but like, you know, not. It's like this is underground, you know, I get, um, it, I get it. I get it. I really like the movie. Um, I, I you know, I think. It took a second watch and like a lot of paying attention <laughs> to, to really appreciate Snatch. Um, and you, like I said, you can tell it's a higher budget. It's a much more polished movie. And there's some there's a lot of scenes that I like better than a lot of the other scenes in Lockstock. But there's something just really, I don't know, really like down to earth about Lockstock that I really like also. I, I can't wait to do the other ones because it's just we're kind of jumping in a little bit into the future with rock and Rolla and the gentleman, right? Like uh, 2008 and 2018, I believe. So kind of, yeah. and, and it's kind of similar movies, right? Well, they're both kind of London gangster movies. I think from what I, you know, uh, rock and roller is kind of higher stakes. And so is definitely they're like higher up in the criminal world. Um, but I mean, so in between, for Guy Ritchie, in between this movie in 2000 and 2008, he did Swept Away, which is the Madonna movie, and he did Revolver, which is like, really has bad reviews. So, or actually kind of, of his gangster movies, kind of going in order to Rock and Rolla, and then he does The Man from Uncle, King Arthur, Aladdin, and then The Gentleman. So we are legitimately, of his gangster movies, just going chronologically in order doing them in in a row so um and then after that he's he's done three since then really fucking quickly he like didn't work that quick and now he is knocking them out yeah i love this movie i i think kind of right now like my love of these movies is sort of the same chronologically like with each one i like it more i am curious though i remember loving rock and roll though so i'm curious if when i watch it again if I will like it more or less than the gentleman, because right now I love the gentleman. So I'm just excited to do these next two. So you've seen the gentleman. I've seen all four of these. Oh, okay. So I'm the, I'm the newbie. In this. this is just a month for me, baby. So got it. Got it. Well, thanks for listening to another episode of I finally watched. This is David. And this is Alon. And I finally watched snatch. Snatch.